All right, diving into the world of Terraform today. We've got a stack of training material from you. Um, looks like we're going to try to automate like <laughs> all the infrastructure. No more clicking around endless menus, huh? Yeah, you got it. Yeah. That's the beauty of Terraform, right? It's like having this universal translator, but for computers. Yeah. And it helps them build out your cloud infrastructure. Okay, intrigued. But before we like get too far into it, what is Terraform exactly? Because, I mean, I hear this phrase infrastructure as code, and it's a little intimidating, honestly. Yeah, it sounds like, uh, you know, some black magic at first, but it's really not that bad. Basically, instead of you manually going and setting up servers, networks, and all that through, you know, clicking through a visual interface, you're actually writing code to describe what you want that infrastructure to look like. So I'm like writing a script for my cloud to follow, basically. Exactly. And the language that we use for Terraform is it's called HCLer. It's HashiCorp configuration language. It's designed to be human readable. So uh, you don't have to like, you know, be summoning any rituals to make it work. Okay, well that makes me feel a lot better. Yeah. Just think of it like uh, like writing blueprints. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But in a way that both you A and D, the computer, can understand. Okay, I like that. So blueprints it is. But how does Terraform actually interact with like my cloud provider like is there some agent i need to install or like how does that all actually work that's one of the things that makes terraform kind of elegant in a way it uses what's called a push model so um you can think of it like this instead of me sending you a package through like you know a delivery service what if i could just like push it directly to you that's kind of how yeah. terraform works so the program itself you download it and then it actually interacts directly with your cloud provider's api okay so no extra software nothing to manage just straight to the cloud exactly okay i can get behind that but what are those instructions then because it sounds like there's like a couple of different pieces to this terraform puzzle you're right there are a few key parts so first you have what are called configuration files these end with a jaw tf and that's where you actually write your hcl code and in those configuration files, you're basically defining the resources that you want to create. So that's like your servers, your networks, you name it. So those configuration files, think of those as the blueprints for your infrastructure. So the configuration files are the blueprints. What else we got? Then you have what are called provider plugins. These are like adapters that let Terraform talk to different cloud platforms. So let's say you want to set up stuff on AWS. Well, there's a provider plugin for that. If you want to use Google Cloud or Azure, you name it, there's probably a plugin out there for it. So Terraform's like the universal remote for the cloud. Exactly. I like it. And this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. So Terraform keeps track of something called state data. Think of this as Terraform's memory. It remembers what you've built so far. And that's super important when you need to make changes later on. Why is that so important? So let's say, for example, you want to add a new server to your setup, right? Terraform will look at your updated code, compare it to the state data, and it'll say, okay, here are the exact modifications I need to make. And that prevents accidental deletions oh. and make sure that your infrastructure is consistent. And it just saves you from a lot of headaches down the line. It's like having like a perfect change log that's always kept in sync. Exactly. State data. Got sure. it. It's Terraform's way of making sure it doesn't like accidentally bulldoze my entire infrastructure. Exactly. Speaking of infrastructure, the training that you shared uses um, this company called Acme, right? Yes. What's their deal? So Acme is a global risk assessment firm. So they analyze all sorts of crazy what if scenarios, right. right? And you're stepping into the role of their IT admin. And your task is to build a development environment for their new web app on AWS. Risk assessment. OK, so definitely more interesting than spreadsheets. So what does that initial setup look like? Are we talking like a complex web of servers and networks? Where do we even start? We start small. So you're a developer, Samantha. She just needs a basic web server up and running to get started. So your hmm. first mission, if you choose to accept it, is to create what's called a virtual network, a VPC. And then within that network, a subnet and then a single server. That's an EC2 instance. And all the necessary routing and security rules to actually like, you know, control the traffic. OK, so pretty straightforward, pretty simple. But how do we actually tell Terraform to build all of that? This is where the configuration files and the plugins and all that comes in, right? Exactly. So remember those building blocks we talked about earlier? The providers, the resources, the data sources, they all come into play here. Refresh my memory. How do those fit together again? Right. So in your HCL code, you'll start by defining what's called a provider. And in this case, it's going to be the AWS provider since we're working with Amazon Web Services. And what this does is it tells Terraform which cloud platform it needs to talk to. 
Got it. So the provider sets the stage, basically. Exactly. And then and then you define the actual actors on that stage. So those are the resources. This is where you'd specify, okay, I need a VPC, I need a subnet, I need an EC2 instance, and all the nitty gritty details for each one, like what size it should be and what region connected to this network, all those things. Okay. And what about data sources? What's their role in this infrastructure play we're putting on? Data sources are like your stage manager. So they let you fetch additional information from your cloud provider. So for example, you might use a data source to ask AWS, hey, what regions are available? Or you know, what are the valid instance types for my server? So it helps you make informed decisions and keep things organized. So providers set the stage, resources are the actors, and data sources are making sure the whole production runs smoothly. Exactly. I'm starting to see how this all comes together, but before I like unleash my Paraform code on the world, are there any safety nets in place? You know, <laughs> just in case I accidentally tell it to delete everything. You're thinking like a true engineer. Yeah. And luckily, Terraform has this built-in safety net, and it's called the workflow. Okay. And it involves a few key commands that you'll use to manage your infrastructure. All right, walk me through this workflow, because I'm feeling a little empowered, but also a little bit you know, nervous about accidentally unleashing chaos here. Sure, and that's the right mindset to have. So the first command that you'll use is called Terraform init. Think of this like hitting the download button for your infrastructure project. So what this does is it downloads all the necessary provider plugins based on what you specified in your configuration. So gathering all the tools and materials before you start building? Exactly. Once you have all those tools, then you can run what's called Terraform plan. Mm -hmm. And this is like the dress rehearsal. So Terraform will analyze your code and it will show you exactly what changes it would make without actually executing anything yet. Okay, so it's my chance to double check that I'm not about to launch a thousand servers by accident. Precisely. Okay, so if the plan looks good, then what? Then it's showtime. You run Terraform apply. And that's when Terraform actually goes out and builds or modifies your infrastructure based on your code and the plan that you just reviewed. Terraform apply the moment of truth. Yes. But what if things go wrong? Is there a way to like undo everything? Asking for a friend, of course. There is, but you have to use it with extreme caution. It's the Terraform destroy command. That sounds ominous. It is. Okay. This command tells Terraform to delete everything, and I mean everything, that it has built based on its current state data. So it's super useful for cleaning up your test environments, but in a production environment. <laughs> Triple check your code before you run that one. It's like the, are you really, really sure? button. Okay, noted. I will treat Terraform Destroy with the utmost respect. Please do. But you know, we've got our web server, it's up and running, we've got our safety nets in place, we're feeling good. But this initial setup, it's kind of a single point of failure, right? Mm -hmm. What happens if that one server decides to take a vacation at the worst possible time? You're thinking ahead, which is great. And you're right, relying on a single server, it's kind of like building a house of cards. Luckily, Terraform has a lot more tricks up its sleeve to make your infrastructure more resilient. Okay, so we've got this basic web server, right? It's up and running, but it does feel a little precarious. Like, what if that one server decides to take a coffee break, right, when Acme's, you know, biggest client needs to assess some risks? Yeah, you're thinking about this the right way. Resilience is key. You can't rely on a single server if you want to build something reliable. And that's where this idea of multi-zone deployment comes in. So instead of putting all our eggs in one basket, so to speak, we're going to spread our servers across multiple availability zones uh, within our AWS region. Redundancy. Okay, I like it. Exactly. It's like having a backup generator for your backup generator. Yeah. But now we're talking about multiple servers, right? Does that mean I have to write out the Terraform code for each one of those individually? Because that sounds a little tedious. And that's where Terraform gets really elegant. So instead of us having to manually configure each server, we can actually use loops. So we're essentially going to define a pattern for our servers, tell it how many times we want to repeat that pattern, and Terraform does all the heavy lifting for us. Loops. So instead of copy pasting code a bunch of times, I can just be like, hey, Terraform, take this blueprint, make me three of them, but spread them out, please. Exactly. And then to distribute the traffic across all of those servers, we'll use what's called a load balancer. And this acts like a traffic cop, essentially. Mm -hmm. It'll direct incoming requests to the appropriate server. And the best part is we can define that load balancer and all of its connections to our servers right within our Terraform code. It all gets managed together. That is very slick. Right. So we've got multiple servers, a load balancer, all managed by Terraform. Starting to feel like a real production-ready setup now. But I have to admit, as we add more things, these configuration files, they're starting to feel a little 
you know, daunting. It's a lot to keep track of. Oh, yeah. Organization is key, especially as your infrastructure starts to grow. And that's where variables and outputs, they become your new best friends. Okay, I'm always up for making new friends. Tell me more about these variables and outputs. So imagine you're baking a cake. Yep. You have your recipe, right? That's like your Terraform code. And then variables, those are like the ingredients. So instead of me hard coding the values like directly into the recipe or the code in this case, we can use variables to represent things like, you know, the server size, the region, or even something as simple as the application version. So instead of saying two cups of flour in the recipe, it's X cups of flour and I define X somewhere else. Exactly. That way you can easily change the value of X without having to modify the entire recipe every single time. And in Terraform, this is especially crucial for sensitive information. Like, for example, your AWS credentials. You never want to hard code those directly into your configuration files. Right. You don't want those secret ingredients ending up in the wrong hands. What about these outputs you mentioned? Outputs. Those are like the delicious aroma of the cake after it's baked. Mm -hmm. So it's like the results of your hard work. And these allow you to easily access specific information about your deployed infrastructure. So... Let's say you want to quickly grab the public IP address of your load balancer so you can actually uh, like access your website, right? You can define an output for that, and Terraform will make sure that you can retrieve that information really easily. Okay, so variables are the ingredients going in, outputs are the delicious results coming out. I'm liking this culinary analogy. I'm, I'm guessing there's more to this whole like organization magic, though, right? Oh, you know it. <laughs> there's one more tool we can use to keep our code nice and tidy, and it's called locals. Think of locals like your prep work, mm. you know, like chopping veggies, measuring spices. So they're basically internal variables within your Terraform code. Yeah. So let's say you need to calculate some complex value that's based on, you know, other variables. You can define that as a local once and then reference it throughout your code. And that just keeps everything clean, nice, and avoids a lot of repetition. Okay, locals, variables, outputs. <laughs> My Terraform toolbox is starting to feel pretty well stocked here. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, can we go back to state data for a second? Of course. You've mentioned it a couple of times. You seem to be very passionate about it, how important it is. Are there like best practices for managing state data effectively? Absolutely. Yeah. Treating your state data with respect is like rule number one for a smooth Terraform experience. So always back it up. Always back it up. Okay. Treat it like precious cargo. But backups aside, are there other common pitfalls people should watch out for when it comes to state data? One of the big ones is manual edits. While it is technically possible to edit that state data file directly, it's kind of like trying to fix a clock with a hammer. Okay. You're much better off letting Terraform handle those modifications through its normal workflow. Because a messed up state file, it can lead to all sorts of weird and unpredictable behavior. Okay. I will keep my hands off that state data file unless absolutely necessary. But, you know, here's a thought. What if Acme, you know, they're doing their risk assessments and they decide, hey, we want to expand our infrastructure beyond AWS. Maybe we want to try out a different cloud provider. Does that mean starting from scratch with Terraform? And that's the beauty of Terraform. It's what we call cloud agnostic. So if Acme decides to use Google Cloud, Azure, or even a combination of providers, mm -hmm. we can actually adapt our code without having to reinvent the wheel. Mm. We just need to add the appropriate provider plugin, define our resources for that platform, and Terraform takes care of the rest. So it really is like a multi-cloud maestro. It can conduct this whole orchestra of infrastructure. You got it. Mm. And just like a conductor needs their score, right? Right. We need to make sure that our Terraform code is well organized, it's maintainable, especially as our infrastructure grows. Which I can imagine could get pretty tricky. I mean, we've already covered like variables, locals, outputs. Is there anything else we can do to keep our code from turning into a tangled mess, especially if we have, you know, multiple people working on it? You're already anticipating the next level of Terraform mastery here. And luckily, there are even more tools and techniques at our disposal. All right, lay it on me. What are these next level Terraform techniques you've been hinting at? We've got variables, outputs, locals. What else can we do to like really wrangle this infrastructure code and make it sing? So remember how we talked about loops, creating multiple servers without repeating ourselves? Yeah, loops were cool. That was just the tip of the automation iceberg. Terraform lets you take that efficiency even further with things like functions and modules. Functions? Those sound a little more complex than loops. What kind of magic can we do with functions? Think of functions like 
built-in helpers for your Terraform code. Mm -hmm. So let's say you need to manipulate some text. Maybe you want to extract part of a server name or you know you need to do some calculations, like maybe dynamically set the size of your storage based on some other variables. Terraform has a function for that. Mm -hmm. Even things like working with dates and times, which comes in handy if you need to schedule tasks or set up like, you know, expirations for things. So if loops help me avoid repetition, then functions give me more control and flexibility within the code itself. You got it. Okay, I like it. You also mentioned modules, which sound even more intriguing. What are those all about? So imagine you've built this really awesome reusable piece of infrastructure. Right. Let's say it's like a network setup. You've got your subnets, your routing tables, your security groups, the whole shebang. Wouldn't it be great if you could package that up and then reuse it in other projects without having to copy paste like tons of code. That would be amazing, especially if I'm working on multiple projects or if Acme decides, hey, this is our standard infrastructure pattern and we want to use it everywhere. It'd be like a blueprint for a blueprint. You got it. And that's exactly what Terraform modules are for. You can create your own custom modules or you can leverage pre-built modules from the public Terraform registry. Wait. There's a public registry of Terraform modules? Oh, yeah. There's a whole registry out there. So someone else might have already solved the problem that I'm facing, and I can just, like, borrow their solution. And that's the beauty of it, right? So the Terraform registry, it's like a gold mine of modules for all sorts of use cases. Everything from, you know, simple networking setups to, like, complex multi-cloud deployments. So it's like having access to this library of proven infrastructure designs that are already plugged into your project. This is amazing. Okay, so I can write my own modules, share them with the world if I want to, and then benefit from like the collective wisdom of the Terraform community. It's like open source infrastructure. It really is. Okay, but we've got to talk about security here, right? Yeah. Because as we're automating more and more of this infrastructure, we're dealing with API keys, passwords, all this kind of stuff. How do we keep all of that safe within our Terraform code? Yeah. That's a really good point. And the golden rule here is like, never hard code that sensitive information directly into your Careform code. Instead, you'll use what's called secure backends. Secure backends, okay, so what are those? Like a digital vault? Exactly. There are systems that are specifically designed to store and manage secrets. Mm -hmm. So instead of you having your you know, AWS secret key right there in the code, you'd store it in the secure backend, and then you tell Terraform, hey, my secrets are over there, this is how you access them, and Terraform will take care of the rest. Okay. So secure backends, they're like our digital vault, and Terraform knows the combination to get in. But even with the best security, like things can still go wrong, right? What happens when my Terraform code decides to throw a tantrum? Who do I call for help? Well, troubleshooting is just part of the game, right? Even for us infrastructure wizards. The good news is Terraform has some tools to help you out. So the first step is often the simplest one, read the error messages. Okay. Terraform will usually give you some pretty helpful hints about what went wrong and maybe where to look for the issue. So don't panic, read the error message carefully. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And if you get really stuck, don't be afraid to consult the documentation. HashiCorp has done a phenomenal job with their docs. They walk you through, you know, common errors, troubleshooting steps, even like some more advanced debugging techniques. No shame in checking the docs. I've learned that one the hard way many times. Right. But we've covered so much ground here, like from basic configuration to loops, functions, modules, secure backends. Is there anything else we need to know to like achieve true Terraform mastery. You're well on your way, but there's one final frontier we should probably at least touch on, and that's the realm of CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment. CICD, that sounds exciting, but also maybe a little terrifying. So what's the general idea here? Imagine a world where every time you make a change to your infrastructure code, it automatically gets tested, it gets validated, it gets deployed. No more manual uploads, no more clicking through menus. You push your code to a repository and like magic happens. It's like a self-driving car for my infrastructure. Okay, I'm listening, but how do we create this magic? That's where tools like Jenkins come in. Hmm. So Jenkins is an automation server that plays really nicely with Terraform. You can create what are called pipelines. So think of them like automated workflows that define each step of your CICD process. So for example, your pipeline might run some automated tests, it might execute a Terraform plan you know, to preview the changes. And then finally, if everything looks good, it can run Terraform apply to actually deploy it. So Jenkins is like the conductor of our infrastructure orchestra, making sure everything happens in the right order at the right time. You got it. 
And speaking of things happening in the right order, Terraform also has some built-in features to help with collaboration, especially when you have multiple people working on the same infrastructure. Remember those workspaces we talked about? Right, workspaces. We touched on those earlier. How do they fit into all of this? So each workspace gets its own state file, right? Mm -hmm. So you can have a workspace for development, one for testing, one for production, all managed with the same Terraform code base. And this makes it incredibly easy to test out changes in a safe environment before you unleash them on the world. So I can go wild, try out all my crazy ideas in my development workspace without worrying about, like, accidentally taking down Acme's production website. Exactly. <laughs> and with Jenkins, you can automate that entire process of promoting code from one workspace to the next as it passes your tests and makes its way to production. This is amazing. We've gone from manually configuring servers to, like, literally orchestrating this whole symphony of infrastructure automation with Terraform. This has been an incredible deep dive. Any final words of wisdom before we wrap things up? I think the biggest takeaway here is to embrace the learning process. Terraform is incredibly powerful. We've only scratched the surface of what's possible. So, you know, don't be afraid to experiment, read the docs, tap into the community, and most importantly, have fun building out your cloud infrastructure. And for everyone listening, if you're feeling inspired to explore the world of infrastructure automation, remember, Terraform isn't just about writing code. It's about shaping the future of how we build and manage the digital world.